And now it gives me great, 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 great honor and immeasurable joy to prepare you for the learning experience of yourself as an African descendant, as an African descendant that can be used as a key to unlock your mental door of who you are and from what you come. Our elder, our scholar, our scholar, and a multi genius, and a multi genius. And I ask that you help me by standing and giving a round of applause for our scholar, Dr. John Henry Clark. Dr. John Henry Clark. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm pleased with the invitation. We have a lot of work to do. And we want to go directly to the work. We're, we're here in um, Harlem. We're on Convent Avenue between 140th and 141st Street, Convent Avenue. Right down the block is City College in New York where Dr. Leonard Jeffries was the uh, chairperson for black studies. Edward Scobie was his deputy. The grandmother of, of, of hip hop, uh, Camille Yarborough was on staff. James Smalls was director of student affairs and activities. Uh, this was a hub in this area here. But the area that you're looking at here, <clears throat> when, you, when you look at the houses and the homes that they have here, the tenements, they don't build homes like this. This was an exclusive area. Right across the street is a place called Hamilton Terrace. That is where uh, Alexander Hamilton had his home uh, here in New York. So this is an exclusive neighborhood. And um, I, I, I give a lot of credit to our sister, uh, Dr. Regent uh, Adlai Sanford, who was an educator here in New York, in Brooklyn in particular. And uh, she, she had a school that she turned around miraculously. Dr. Regent Adlai Sanford and, and, and other uh, concerned folk wanted to have a place to honor Professor John Henry Clark. And so here we are between 140th and 141st Street. And this is where so many different uh, activities occurred, uh, conversations. I've, I've been in this building so many different times. You'll see it throughout installing stools, uh, various masks. And again, as I said, the house initially was designed to be a place where people of color could come and sit, people who are of like mind. Um, the main room here on this side is obviously the stool or the chair emeritus for uh, Dr. Clark Nolan. And 20 plus years that we've had the property sits in this particular chair. Again, when individuals say that people of color cannot join together and link arms to do things, the house, the sister that owned the property wanted to ensure that we had the house. Then once she moved on, uh, Dr. Sanford and others who were very instrumental in speaking with her donated the house with that. There was a mortgage that needed to be retired. So to retire that mortgage, as we go to the next layer, you'll be able to see um, a quilt. And on this quilt, um, you'll see every, every benefactor that has been a part of us from the very inception. So again, this is the Betty Shabazz room. And as you see this quilt here, everything from Essence, Sony Music, uh, Camille Cosby, Ed Lover, uh, you name it, Oprah Winfrey, Essence, Dr. Dre. So long before individuals were talking about unifying and drawing together, the individuals that were part of this, um, Nabisco, so you can see that there were some very strong bodies and individuals that was able to draw together um, individuals again to retire the mortgage on this property. This house has had a lot of different activities and this is where the activities normally occur. So I'm sitting on the stoop uh, of Clark House just having this conversation to talk about the importance of those scholars that came before us and, and whose shoulders we are resting on right now. Uh, and, and if I'm seen, if, if you can see me, it's because I'm on their shoulders and what they contributed uh, to us as a people. And my uh, relationship with Dr. Clark goes back 
many years, um, about 12 and a half, and the old heads, they would put us on their uh, handlebars of their bikes, and they would take us different places. We just ride. You know, uh, you know, one of my favorite experiences is, is when they would take us down to um, Henry Hudson, um, you know, the Hudson River. And then they lecture us, these old heads, you know, and they would teach us our history and our culture. Same thing that I used to do on 125th Street is what they used to do, so it was a cycle. But one day these brothers and sisters brought us up to Harlem and they um, sat us before this gentleman uh, who was lecturing on, on African history. There were about five or six of us who were very young. And we, we sat like in front of him on the floor. And the old heads and other people that were in attendance sat in the chairs. And at the end of the presentation, they brought us up to meet this gentleman. And they introduced us, this is Dr. John Henry Clark. Prior to my name being Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, my name was Booker Tellia Farrell Coleman Jr. I was named after my father. My father was named after Booker T. Washington. And um, when they introduced me to Professor Clark, they said, oh, you're going to be a great teacher one day. And I remember him telling me that. Oh, Booker T., you're going to be a great teacher one day. And like that wasn't on my mind. I, I wasn't thinking about being a teacher. I, I, I was more interested in astronomy and cosmology than I was being a teacher. But it goes to show you, sometimes in life things happen. And I remember um, he gave us a homework assignment. This is the homework assignment Dr. Clark gave us. He said, go home and look in the mirror and tell the person that you're looking at, I love you and mean it. And he said, because if you can't do that, then there's nothing anyone else can do for you. And that stayed in my mind. I assumed full responsibility. And this is one of the things that Dr. Clark, even as I graduated, now, I, you know, I'd like to tell you that I, I used to go to him when I was 13 and all the rest of that. No, it, it wasn't like that. My relationship with him grew as I matured. I began to realize his importance to me as I grew and as I matured, I began to realize his importance. But I did have an incident when, when I was 14 years old, because now mind you this, I grew up Roman Catholic. I went to Roman Catholic elementary school from kindergarten to eighth grade. I went to high school. I went to the same high school that a brother by the name of Lou Alcinda went to. You know him as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Now, here's a story about Kareem. Kareem belonged to a writer's club in Harlem that Dr. Clark taught. And there's a picture of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar <clears throat> sitting in a room with other students. When he was a high school student, Dr. Clark is off to the side and he is interviewing. Dr. Clark arranged for this young group to interview Muhammad Ali. There's a picture of them together. And it, it, it's just interesting how things turn around and how things happen as it relates to history because you have to remember that you would say, well, where is the connection between Muhammad Ali and Dr. Clark? But you'd also have to realize that Dr. Clark was, uh, was Malcolm X's history teacher. So it could very well have been that Malcolm X connected them together in terms of allowing Muhammad Ali to come in and be interviewed by this young group of high school students who belonged to a writer's group in, in uh, Harlem. And when I was uh, 14 years old, believe it or not, I want to be a priest. I had been a choir boy. I had... I was an altar boy. I served in the Cardinal at the time, Cardinal Francis Spellman. I, I served as an altar boy in his, um, in his funeral. And I spoke fluent Latin. I spoke Latin better than the priest did. That's how deep I was into this. And I remember um, I was in the basement of the church and I was cleaning up, doing things. I want to be a priest now. And um, I came upon a book. And the book was talking about this sect of priests that protected the, the Virgin Mother and Christ Child during the Nazi invasion of Poland. And in parentheses, it said, 
Our Lady of Cheslakova, the Black Madonna and Child. I, I had never heard that in my life. I had never heard about no Black Madonna and Child in my life. So I called Dr. Clark. This was before cell phone. Um, I, I called him um, from the street, you know, when they had the phone booth. And uh, if, if you knew Dr. Clark, you would know that when you talked to him and he was about to hit you with something, you, you, you would hear silence on the phone. You, you could almost hear his smirk. And I got to understand what it was by being with him when he did it. I, I watched him do it. But at this time, he said, well, okay, when you get the chance, come on up and uh, we'll talk. And so went to his house, Brownstone in Harlem, Street is named after him today, Dr. John Henry Clark Place. And uh, I sat with him, and he gave me a Xerox copy. Now, when I say Xerox, I'm talking about um, when it was purple, okay? Uh, you, know, I, you know, I'm talking about when you, you made copies, you know, you, you, you cranked it out on that machine. You know, we're not talking about today's technology. And um, mimeograph, it was called. And, and I remember that it was called the boy who painted Christ black. He said, I want you to go home and read it and get a sense of it and then, you know, call me, come back, we'll talk about what you feel about it. He said, don't forget to take notes. And so, okay, I read it. I read it on my way home from the, I was on the number seven bus. I was reading it on the bus. I had read it by the time I got off the bus. And, uh, changed my thinking it, it it just you know like I remember my feelings as what might be called a young seminary and I wasn't in seminary school I was in high school I was a sophomore I was 14 and I read it and um, I said okay I'm not gonna jump to nothing I'm gonna keep on going I read it again read it again I read it a number of times I brought it to school with me. During lunch, I would read it. And then I called him. And he said, come on up, we'll talk. He said, you got your notes? I said, yeah, I got my notes. And uh, I went up and I talked to him. And then he started dropping one story after another. The boy who painted Christ black psychologically put me in a frame of mind and you see, family, this is what I've attempted to do in education because I've studied Dr. Clark's method and I, and I teach his method. It's called uh, developing the master teacher from within. We're trying to restore those values that have been taken away. And we're trying to get across to black youth that they have a part to play in the making of a new world. They have the imagination, they have the energy. You must first restore that part of yourself that has been negated by oppression. It is as, it's as essential to you as dread and war. It is part of the food that must feed your spirit in the world of tomorrow. It is part of what you will have to transfer to your children. Because it just wasn't what Dr. Clark told me. It just wasn't how he told me. It's the combination of what he said, how he said, understanding and feeling my thought process coming from where I was coming from. As a young black man growing up Roman Catholic and wanting to be a priest. He, he almost had to be like a brain surgeon when he operated on my brain that day when he was telling me those stories. Because for some people, they can lose their very bearing in life because of the grounding that they have in their spiritual system that guides them, that, that shapes them. So you have to be careful how you talk to them. And I went home and I spoke to my parents. My mother who was the Catholic, my father was AME, Zion, uh, African Methodist Episcopal. And so my father, 
He was more concerned with how my mother was going to react than, you know, him. He, it, it didn't really matter to him. And so when I went there and we spoke, she said, are you sure? I said, yeah. Uh, because I was at the door of no return at that point. There's no way the church could have pulled me back. And when I spoke to Dr. Clark, he then gave me another sort of kind of discussion to, to take me back into an understanding of what I had actually done, which my parents couldn't have done. Uh, they, they knew something happened. They didn't know what. I never said it was Dr. Clark. Um, and I don't know if it was him. It was what he said, but it, it was almost like divine providence interrupting something. And this is why I've, I've also, all, often uh, quoted Dr. Clark and I've often given him a great deal of credit for his shaping of the way I approach things. And you see, this is the difference between African Christians, African Muslims, African Hebrew Israelites, and Europeans. We don't have faith and we don't believe. We may think we have faith and we may think we believe, but in reality we know. But we give credit to somebody else because of the nature of the enslavement process and the slave Bible that we've been brought up on. And so we're looking out here, but they have taught us to thank an outside agency because it is that slave mentality that if you don't see the divinity within yourself and you see the divinity in somebody else, that they can hustle you. But I have to tell you that when you come from the background that I came from, you have to understand that Jesus spoke in parables. And by that, in speaking in parables, if Jesus was talking to fishermen, he told an analogy, a metaphor, as it relates to the water and the fish. If he was talking to bankers, he talked to bankers and told the same story that he told about the fish, but he put it in monetary terms. If he was talking to a, a shepherd, he would tell the same story that he told the banker and the fisherman, but he put it in terms of being a pastor and sheep. And so what Dr. Clark did was he took the analogy of the street and he placed it in the church so that people on the street could understand what's happening in the church. And he told the choice select people the story in the church to understand what's happening on the street. He spoke in parables. He spoke in metaphors. He spoke in a way that no matter who he was speaking to, they would be able to understand the story, but they would understand the story in the context of their thinking skills. This was the genius of Dr. John Henry Clark. And this is why I find it important to teach his methodology of teaching. And I've utilized this method throughout my career. And this is one of the great fortunate things that I've had in my relationship with Professor John Henry Clark. And I think that I learned more as I matured because he opened up to me and he began to trust me. And I remember I was in a room, there was a lot of people in the room. And I remember he said, Booker T, look around the room. And okay, I looked around the room. There was a lot of people. And most of them were in the room because of him. He said, one day you're gonna notice that there's a lot of people that's in this room right now that's not gonna be in this room down the road. He said, because this is only for a choice few people. He said, everybody not ready to do this. And as time went on, and I always had my notebook when I was with him. Every time I was in Professor Clark's presence, I always had my notebook out with my pen in my hand. And I think that that's when he began to realize this young brother is serious about what he's doing. Because from the time he told me about the notebook, Remember when I was 14 and he gave me that piece on the boy who painted Christ black and he said, don't forget your notebook. Dr. Clark was a scholar. He did not play. My, my most challenging teacher 
and the person that expected the most from me, no matter what class I've ever taken in my life, physics, chemistry, math, calculus. Dr. Clark was my most challenging teacher because he did things that the others had no idea how to do. And Dr. Clark opened up my mind and he made me look within and wonder and think. And he made me use my imagination and my determination. And he taught me, when you present yourself to the people, always be prepared. Never assume that you don't have to be prepared. That's what he used to always say, be prepared. The other thing he used to always say is, perfect your craft. Don't ever think that you are at a point in your life that you don't need to study no more. And this is why one of the things that I focus on when I go to different schools to do staff development and work with staff, I believe that a school should be where adults go to learn and children attend to benefit from what the adults are learning. I think for you to graduate from college with a so-called degree in education, that you think that that's all you need for the rest of your life. You never stop. Life is school, school is life. That's what I tell parents. You have to take and assume the teaching position in your children's life. Because you know, sometimes when you put your sacredness in someone else's hands, you may end up wishing that you never gave it to them. Why do we want to give our sacred legacy to somebody that don't even know their home? How are you going to teach my children their history when you don't even know your history? So I want to thank the people who are doing this because in time, you're all are going to come to brothers like myself and sisters who are our counterparts doing this work in educating the community as it relates to their culture, using the methodologies of Professor John Henry Clark to teach your children for something that people are saying they don't want to teach, but they can't even teach the subjects that they've been in school to learn how to teach. So how are they going to teach you something that they don't even understand? They can't even teach the things they think they understand. If it is to be, it's up to thee. It's, that's it. That's the bottom line. So with that, we give praise to Professor John Henry Clark for all that he did and all that he said. We appreciate him, and we ask him his continued guidance. Peace.